The next item of business is a, debate, a member's business debate on motion 12516 in the name of Adam Tompkins on welcome to Glasgow, a world city of music. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Adam Tompkins to open the debate. Mr Tompkins, please. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank all members who supported my motion and who will speak in this evening's debate. Uh, the debate was secured some weeks ago, long before the fire last weekend that consumed not only the Glasgow School of Art, but also one of my favourite live music venues in Glasgow, the O2 ABC on Sockey Hall Street. I've enjoyed that venue for years, not because of its enormous mirror ball, the biggest in Europe apparently, but because of its size and its sound quality. With the capacity of about 1,300, the ABC is smaller than the Barrowlands, uh, but bigger than Oren Moore and King Tut's. You could always get close to the stage, and because of the acoustics in the room, bands could turn it up and up without compromising sound quality. And I've seen uh, countless great gigs in that venue, uh, including some of my favorite bands, the Felice Brothers, Jason Isbell, Drive By Truckers, among them. The smaller ABC2 in the same building is also a great venue, much more intimate than the main stage. I was last, let, last there to see Courtney Marie Andrews earlier this year when she played as part of the Celtic Connections Festival. So I go to a lot of gigs, presiding officer, and I know I'm not alone among members of this parliament in enjoying what Glasgow's live music scene has to offer. And that's what my motion tonight and this debate is all about. Glasgow has world-class venues from the Hydro to King Tut's. And many of these venues are famous not just throughout Scotland, but throughout the world. Bands love playing Glasgow because the venues are great and the people who flock to them are the best crowds in the world. Nothing beats a Friday night gig in Glasgow. Bands come to Glasgow to be discovered, and they keep coming back once they've broken through. And of course, Glasgow grows its own bands and musicians. Bell and Sebastian, Teenage Fan Club, Mogwai, Franz Ferdinand, Travis, many, many, many more. People make Glasgow, they say. Well, music makes Glasgow, and Glasgow makes music every night of the week. All of this adds immeasurably to Glasgow's rich and diverse cultural life, but it also makes a vital contribution to Glasgow's economy, and indeed to Scotland's economy more generally. Music is a driver of economic growth for Glasgow. The value to Glasgow's economy of live music attendance is in the region of £160 million a year. To put that in context, more than £3 million is spent every week in Glasgow as a direct result of the live music events that the city hosts. This sustains more than, more than 1,100 jobs across the city and attracts nearly half a million music tourists to Glasgow every year. And yet, a recently commissioned report for Scottish Enterprise and Glasgow Life explains that much more could and should be done to build on, to develop, and to capitalize on the strength of Glasgow's live music scene. The report, Growing the Value for Music Tourism in Glasgow, is a terrific piece of work, presiding officer, and I commend it to members. Today, Danny Cusick, the tourism director at Scottish Enterprise, said, and I agree with him, Glasgow has huge potential to develop its music through its rich cultural heritage, as well as its range of atmospheric venues and world-class performers. We can do that not only by increasing audience numbers, by increasing audience spend, both on and off-site, and by increasing the numbers of music tourists that stay overnight or longer when they visit Glasgow for a gig. We can do it also by being much more creative and imaginative about how we celebrate Glasgow as one of the world's leading cities of music. Ten years ago, in 2008, Glasgow became the first city in the UK to be recognised as a UNESCO World City of Music. Liverpool was awarded the same designation in 2015, but Glasgow remains the only city in Scotland to have been recognised in this way. Yet we do painfully little to broadcast this fact. I've lived in Glasgow for 15 years, and in that time I've been to dozens, if not hundreds, of gigs, yet I confess, until recently, I didn't know that Glasgow is a UNESCO World City of Music. Glasgow could be twinned with other world cities of music, and indeed with other cities with global reputations for the contribution they've made to live music, Nashville, Memphis, or New Orleans, for example. We could learn from each of these great American cities and create within Glasgow music districts. We could signpost and map routes that tell the story of Glasgow's immense and diverse contribution to music, linking the Hydro in Finiston with city centre venues such as the ABC in King Tut's and onto East End landmarks such as the Barrowlands. For relatively modest investment, ideas like these could reap significant rewards in terms of enhancing Glasgow's visitor attractiveness. And with this in mind, presiding officer, music is quite rightly a key pillar 
of Glasgow's Tourism and Visitor Plan, which has set the ambitious target of attracting one million more overnight visitors to Glasgow by 2023. Meeting this target will require cross-party support and collaboration. So I was delighted to see the SNP's councillor, David MacDonald, deputy leader of Glasgow City Council, welcome this evening's debate. I agree with him that for Glasgow, music and tourism go hand in hand. Presiding officer, one quick change that we here could make, which would help the live music business, not only in Glasgow, but across Scotland, is to incorporate the so-called agent, agent of change principle into our planning laws. And this is something that a large number of Glasgow venues expressly called for in evidence to the local government committee in its stage one inquiry into the planning bill that is currently before us. And it is a change that is also supported by UK Music and the Music Venue Trust. In short, the agent of change principle shifts responsibility for mitigating the impact of noise from an existing music venue to a developer moving into the area. Of course, if a new venue wants to open up, the burden is rightly on them to mitigate, to minimize, and to manage the effects of noise. But if a venue already exists and developers bring forward proposals to develop nearby, the venue should not be hit with additional costs. Yet that is what is happening at the moment. It's unfair, presiding officer, and it puts live music venues at a real disadvantage. That's why I lodged yesterday an amendment to the planning bill uh, to put the agent of change principle on a statutory footing as the Parliament's local government committee recommended unanimously last month. I hope that that amendment will attract all party support as this motion and debate have done this evening. Given the devastation of the fire at the Glasgow School of Art and the O2 ABC last weekend, this is quite a week to be talking about the unrivaled contribution that music and especially live music makes both to Glasgow's cultural life and to its economic health and well-being. Music pulses through Glasgow's veins, and no fire will ever stop that. But let's capitalize on what we've got and build on Glasgow's success. It is who we are, it's what we do, because we are a world city of music. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tompkins. I now call Sandra White to be followed by Polly McNeill. Ms. White, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I thank Adam Tompkins for securing this debate, as he has mentioned in his speech at his rather poignant, but particularly what's happening to uh, the Macintosh and the O2 as well. And can I, I also welcome the visitors to the gallery. There's uh, Roger, Mary, Robert, Jeanette, and many others who have a great love of music in Glasgow and, and otherwise as well. And obviously a great interest as well. Uh, presiding officer from the Barraland, which I used to go to many years ago and still go sometimes, the concert hall to King Tut's to the garage to Kel Kelvin Grove Bandstand where it was on Saturday night to see Dr. Hoot. The list could go on and on and on of the many music venues across the city. And of course, we can't forget the city's buskers who are absolutely fantastic as well. Glasgow Kelvin, my constituency alone, has a massive range of world renowned music venues, staging an electric mix of not only well known artists and bands, but also offering opportunities for budding new musicians and songwriters to take part in a very energetic energetic live music scene, and energetic it certainly is. In 2017, I think Adam Tonkins already mentioned this, three venues in Glasgow made the top 100 in the Polestar Top 100 Club venues worldwide. The O2 Academy, King Tut's Wawa Hut and the O2 ABC, with the Hydra sitting at number four of the top 100 venues. An absolutely fantastic achievement for Glasgow, the people in the, the city as well. And it is especially poignant that this is the week we are highlighting the huge contribution live music makes to the city and our culture. We have witnessed another iconic venue devastated by fire. The O2 ABC is a hugely popular venue, and I, along with many others, hope that this much love and we must remember historical place. It used to be a circus, it used to be an ice rink, it used to be a cinema, and a fantastic, as Adam Thompson already said, a fantastic live music venue. We hope sincerely that it will be salvaged and continue to be an important part of the city's music scene. I welcome the report, I think Adam Tompkins also mentioned this, from Scottish Enterprise in collaboration with Glasgow Life. And I really do thank those involved in gathering the information. It's very, very important. It outlines further opportunities for the already well-established music industry we have here in Glasgow. There's huge potential to build on a successful music tourism industry, particularly if we make greater use of our UNESCO 
world city of music. And I do agree, we should be publicising that more, so perhaps Visit Scotland and others could, you know, listen to this debate and hopefully they'll take something from it as well. It's not only in the terms of the cultural effect that it has for our city and for Scotland as a whole as well, it's also the economic effect for the city. Our nighttime economy is hugely important to uh, our city as well. Agent of Change has been mentioned and recommendations for the introduction of Agent of Change would certainly safeguard the future of our venues and a thriving music scene. And I know that the Minister of Local, Gov Minister of Local Government, Adam Tonk, has already said, along with many others, and I think Lewis MacDonald is going to mention that too, because I think uh, I first mentioned it along with Lewis MacDonald quite a while back, so I'm sure that Lewis will uh, put in more to that as well. So this has been mentioned many, many times, and really it is essential, particularly for smaller venues such as King Tut's, uh, who have been under threat from developers and neighbours uh, for a, a number of years, and I've met up with them, um, Jeff Ellis and others, uh, basically to talk about the agent of change and others as well. And the agent of change, if it's realised and put in place, would make a great difference to these smaller venues. And we can't stand by and watch the foundations of Glasgow's successful music landscape, basically. I'm not saying it would be destroyed, but it's, it's a threat if the, the agent for change is not uh, particularly looked at, and particularly if it's to make way for luxury developments within the city, and we lose things like King Tut's and other small, uh, important venues. Live music has and will always be a cornerstone of life across Glasgow, and it is essential that the agent of change principle is adopted into Scottish planning policy to protect these venues. They are both cultural landmarks, tourist attractions, as well as being home to fantastic live music. And it goes without saying, uh, the best audience in the world, that's in Glasgow. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you. I call Pauline McNeill to be followed by Tom Arthur. Miss McNeill, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd also like to thank Adam Tonkins for bringing uh, an excellent debate to this chamber. So there surely could be no doubt that Glasgow is the European capital of music. And I believe it is because the, the passion the people who come to Glasgow and the people who live in Glasgow have for music is what makes it what it is. Music matters to Glaswegians. Music actually matters to people across Scotland as we sell more live tickets than any other part of the UK. Of all genres, and I think it's important to say, whether it's traditional music, classical music, rock and pop, it's the combination of all of those, not to exclude the DJs who are an important creative part of the music scene. King Tut's Wawa Hut has been mentioned many times, probably the fi finest small venue in the world. Um, I won't rehearse what's already been said about the marvellous O2 venue. And we only got to wish that that will return to its glory. The garage, the concert hall, the Clutha, Blackfriars, Kelvin Grove Bandstand, or and more. It could go on. It happened to all be venues which I have experience of playing in myself, who I can speak to how wonderful they are from the largest to the smallest. The number of bands, concerts, music performances at any given time, any given moment in Glasgow is quite astonishing. It is thriving with creativity, and I think it speaks to the character of the city of Glasgow. Berkeley too, which is a well-known rehearsal space for bands. If you've ever visited it, you'll see a constant flow of young bands, and it wouldn't be unusual to bump into Susan Deacon or members of, of Deacon Blue, and it just shows you the uh, metropolitan nature of Glasgow's music scene. But as we've heard, half a million people gig in Glasgow and citizens enjoy their music. The new Transmit Festival, which will be two weekends this summer, is a new addition to the scene. The Hydro, named as the third most popular venue in the world by Polestar, beating Madison Square Gardens, further increases our status as the uh, city of music. And as a Glasgow citizen, it's great that you can attend a concert, go and see Beyonce or whoever your favourite artist is, artist, and be home in half an hour for tea and toast or whatever it is you do. But the report itself highlights that there are 43 live music venues and 35 music bars. And that music is one of the six core themes along with heritage, contemporary art. But perhaps what the report draws our attention to is where we have maybe failed to capitalise on the question of music in the city. It has a status of UNESCO status, um, it has this badge, and the report itself says it's poorly used and largely unrecognised. 
But these assets, as Adam Tompkins and Sandra White have said, are under threat for key venues, which are key to the status that Glasgow has as a city, of, a UNESCO city of music. The Barrowlands Ballroom, King Tut's Wabba Hut, the Sub Club and the Classic Grand are all under threat if we do not get some protection in the forthcoming planning bill. I know Lewis MacDonald will talk about this in greater length than me. But King Tut's this year alone has been fighting two different applications and what they fear is enforcement action being taken against the venue because a new development which hasn't mitted against um, the noise issues um, will face complaints and possible legal action after the building is developed. So it's clear to me if we want to protect that asset then there has to be statutory legislation and in fact I thought that's what the Scottish Government had promised. The Barrowlands Ballroom in Glasgow faces the same issues. There are now severe restrictions for bands loading and unloading, or constant complaints from the new build houses across the road. This was never meant to be the case. If we want to protect music venues in Glasgow, we really need to give them statutory protection. It will not be enough to introduce uh, the agent of change as guidance. It must be law. And if Adam Tompkins has submitted already an amendment if subject to seeing the detail of it, I will be supporting that and I hope other Glasgow MSPs will do too. What to do with the report? Um, Dougal Perman, um, who is the uh, chair of the Scottish Music Indies Association and compiled the inner ear report, um, quite clearly says that there's so many things that we would have to do to bring, the, the, to bring some of these recommendations together. The Scottish Music Industry Organisation um, is something I helped to set, set up along with Ken McIntosh, MSP, Frank McAbeeti, Ian Smith, the former Arts Council, and Tam Coyle. And, and I'm pleased to be associated with it. But the music history of this city is not evident on the ground, and we have to bring that together. Twinning cities with Glasgow, such as Detroit, Rio, Paris, and New York, I think is an important recommendation. In fact, it was the manager of Radiohead that said, first made the case for a Scottish base in New York, because he said it'd be much easier to make contact with record companies if such a base existed. So in conclusion, presiding officer, Glasgow is certainly the world city of music. It should be known as such. It is a title which is deserved. It fits with Glasgow's commitment to music. And I commit to working with other MSPs, Adam Tompkins and others, to ensure that the world knows that's the case. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, call uh, Tom Arthur to be followed by Brian Whittle. Mr Arthur, please. Thank you uh, very much, Presiding Officer. It's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to speak in this debate. And I'd like to uh, begin by thanking Adam Tompkins for bringing this issue to the Chamber. And as well as reminding the Chamber that I am the PLO to the Cabinet Secretary, I should also declare that I'm a member of the Musicians' Union. And I've played in many of the venues we've spoken about this evening. Alas, not the Hydro. Um, not yet. But... I think it's, uh, there's, there's two aspects I want to capture and just the actual kind of value for what it is to have a city like Glasgow in the life and, and the fantastic array of live music they have. And also just I want to touch on what it is for, for a musician to have somewhere like Glasgow, um, which I think is, uh, is very important as well. Um, for me, Glasgow's hardwired into my whole musical development and experience. I went, remember going to my first gig, seeing Def Leppard at the SDCC, going on. Well, it was, it was 19 years ago now. Um, going on to see Megadeth at the Carling Academy. Uh, I, I, I beg your pardon, at the Barrowlands. Sigur Ross at the Carling Academy. Queen and Adam Lambert at the Hydro. Um, and that is just an, an array of the very many fantastic, huge venues we have and many have touched on. A particular venue um, that means a lot to me as well is um, ABC. And there is a, obviously a poignant element to this debate given the events. A, a particularly pleasurable moment for me at the ABC was, was of all things, a, a political party event. Uh, the SNP had a concert there just ahead of the election in 2011, which was a, a fantastic evening. Um, a great experience, live music, and lots of you know, promising talent as well um, performing on stage that evening. Uh, but one of the great things about Glasgow is it's not just all these big headline um, venues that we know about. It's places like the State Bar, Howling Wolf, where you will have one of the best blues jams in Glasgow, Box, Nice and Slazies. Nice so much of the talent we have in Glasgow and emanates relies upon these grassroots venues. They, they, guard upon, they rely upon the opportunities provided by these venues. And, and certainly for me, as a, 
as someone who was you know, for a long time trying to make my way in music and function bands, etc., and for many of my colleagues, having that opportunity was invaluable. It was tough. It was difficult. You were sometimes, it was like a question of Russian roulette, what kind of sound engineer you were going to have that night and whether you were going to hear yourself on stage. But nonetheless, you had an opportunity to connect with people, to connect with punters, to build an audience. And I know folk that have went on to go and have build actually very successful careers. Um, one colleague of mine um, uh, from years back when I was playing, a guy called Gary Johnston, um, he is uh, one of the most, a name which is probably not a household name, but one of the most successful kind of, I think, uh, guitarists and singer-songwriters uh, at Glasgow has been producing a long time. And he regularly, when he gets a chance off from playing many functions and events, will go to places like Chicago and New York and Nashville and go up sta on stage and jam with the best. And when I uh, speak with Gary, when I, mean, I give the opportunity to, and I see the comments that he makes about just how much he values Glasgow, someone who's got the experience of playing in all these different venues, it's clear that Glasgow is a world music city. And it's not just for, for audience and for spectators and people who consume music, but for the people who produce music. And I think if you look at the United States, how effective they have been at advertising Chicago, Nashville, and New York in particular. We, you know, we, we know of the venues which have these iconic status, Madison Square Gardens, the Village Vanguard. We have to be working more to making sure that these venues in Scotland have that same international status, because in terms of facilities, in terms of the um, capacity they have, in terms of the talent and the artists that we can attract, they are world-class venues, and we must celebrate that. And I very much welcome the comments from um, Adam Tompkins regarding looking at ways in which we can link up, because Finiston has, in many regards, been transformed since um, the, the advent of the Hydro, a fantastic venue, and we're seeing the benefits that has. And what we have to be making sure is when people come to the Hydro to enjoy these events, they aren't just jumping on the rate train and going home or popping in for a pint and finishing, but they're heading in and they're exploring all these other venues in Glasgow and having the opportunity to engage in that rich musical culture and heritage. So I would again just like to thank Adam Tompkins for bringing this debate to the Chamber, and I look forward to seeing Glasgow continue to be a thriving and diverse world music city. Thank you. Thank you. I call Brian Whittle to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Lewis MacDonald will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Whittle, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I congratulate my uh, colleague and fellow rocker, Adam Tompkins, on securing time in this chamber to debate, which, as you know, is my, my first love is, is music. But, but firstly, can I also associate myself with Mr Tompkins and others' uh, comments uh, regarding the fire at the Glasgow School of Art and the O2 ABC music venue next door. I, I know the keenest loss we felt in that community uh, and we all recognise the cultural loss of, of both venues and I, I think the loss will be felt much more felt uh, further afield um, uh, and, and hopefully there'll be a way to, to uh, be found to restore <coughs> these uh, iconic buildings. Now, Deputy Presenting Officer, as I've already mentioned, music is my first love. Indeed, my promising career as a rock guitarist was only tragically cut short when I discovered I had a severe lack of talent. <laughs> I, 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 so I have to, I have, I've had to make do with, with, with attending gigs, which I do quite uh, regularly. Now, Glasgow has long been uh, a preferred music destination. I mean, surely everyone in this chamber has a copy of that iconic album, If You Want Blood, by that little old band from Glasgow, ACDC. Now, this album was actually recorded at the old Glasgow Apollo uh, when the band actually appeared on stage wearing the, the 1978 World Cup Scotland kit. Uh, and who doesn't, who doesn't own an album called Quo Live, <laughs> uh, also recorded in the Glasgow Apollo? And I know that it's, 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 it's a, uh, Mr. Tonkin's music of choice as he bounces along on his runs. And, and here you, I, I, I suggest to him you have to be careful what you divulge <laughs> in casual conversations. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, bands used to say, bands used to say that if you can make it in Glasgow, you can make it anywhere because if they love you, they really love you. But if they don't, keep the motor running, <laughs> because, <laughs> because, because as I said, they're a very passionate, very passionate crew. And since these days, uh, uh, Glasgow has grown into one of the world's premier music destinations. In fact, it's the fourth biggest in the world by attendance. Um, I, I, I've attended a couple of concerts this year at the SEC Hydro, and I have a couple more to go, uh, uh, both at the Hydro and at the Barrowlands. I, I would say that uh, just one of those, one of those uh, uh, bands I'm going to see is Def Leppard so you, in, in the autumn. So if you have time to grow your hair, you can quite... <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Arthur, you have time to grow your hair and join me, <laughs> join me at, at the Death Leopard concert. Um, 
I'm also going to the Barrowlands actually to see the first band that I ever saw live in 1980, a, a, a band called Saxon, obviously, if they're still able to, to, to make it onto the stage. Um, <laughs> And to balance that out, Deputy Presiding Officer, to, 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 to balance that coolness out, I also have, uh, <laughs> I have three daughters, which has necessitated me going along to see Steps twice. Can I just say tragedy, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm also, uh, the Pavilion's another, another uh, gig, uh, gig venue that I'm, I'm really uh, attached to because I actually organised a gig there by, uh, uh, for, for three bands, one called Fat Betty, who were a Thin Lizzy tribute band. Absolutely fantastic band. Uh, I also uh, backed up by Gary Mullen, who won Stars in Your Eyes as Freddie Mercury. Uh, and, and the headliner, the headliner, Pete Loaf. <laughs> 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 and and 1,500 people uh, that night enjoyed that. So Deputy Presiding Officer Glasgow uh, has this. Uh, oh, of course I will, for goodness sake, please. Tom Arthur. <laughs> I just wonder if uh, the member would acknowledge that Gary Mullen is actually from Barhead in my Renfrewshire South constituency, showing yet again the level of musical talent that emerges from Barhead. Brian so, Whittle. So despite the fact that he came from Barhead, <laughs> it was, it was, I, I don't know if you've ever met Gary Mullen. Uh, a, more, a man more unlike Freddie Mercury you will ever meet in your life until he puts his kit on. <laughs> He's un unbelievable. Um, Deputy General Officer, Glasgow has an incredible global reputation uh, for music culture. It's a destination for bands setting out on their musical journey right through to, to global bands and stars. And I have to say, in Glasgow, I actually saw uh, Bon Jovi's first ever gig in 1983 as a support band uh, in, in the Glasgow Apollo uh, when they supported Kiss in 1983. I said, there's always a venue, there's always an audience, uh, no matter where they are in their musical journey. It's a business that, 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 that enriches the cultural reputation of the city of Glasgow and, and of, indeed of Scotland, and, and the value of music tourism has been estimated at £160 million, sustaining more than 1,000 jobs, and long may it continue. So can I just once again thank my colleague Arab Tong for bringing this debate to the Chamber, and I look forward to many more music bands and venues in Glasgow, as long as the bands that I follow can still remain in an upright position. Thank you. I don't know if Paul Lewis MacDonald, I don't know if this is another confessional of youth, but there we go. Mr MacDonald. Uh, no, I uh, resist that invitation, presiding officer, but thank you very much. And I too would congratulate Adam Tompkins on securing this debate at what is a critical time for music venues in Glasgow and across the country. The headline story, as we have heard, is the devastation of the O2 ABC in the same conflagration last weekend, which hit the School of Art. But the bigger picture is the loss of venue after venue in our cities and across the country as a result of inadequate legal protection against the effects of inappropriate development. Every live music venue knows that as things stand, it is only one persistent complainer away from being forced to close or to spend prohibitive amounts of money on soundproofing technology. Studio 24 in Edinburgh, downstairs in Aberdeen have already gone and now King Tut's in Glasgow, as Pauline McNeil said, is itself under threat. I was at King Tut's last week, not on that occasion at a gig, but actually at the first meeting of the Scottish Venues Trust, uh, sorry, the Scottish Venues meeting, the first time that has been organised by the Music Venue Trust, and I met representatives of venues all over Scotland, Sneaky Pete's in Edinburgh, Krakatoa and the Lemon Tree in Aberdeen, and the operators of King Tut's itself. Our conversations were about the threats that they face and the opportunity which we have to change the law in their favour. One of the most immediate threats, as I say, is to King Tut's itself, because Glasgow City Council has just granted planning permission for a private residence to be built next door. The terms of that approval, a public document, are disappointing, and they appear to confirm the fear that the Scottish Government's acceptance of the principle of agent of change does not of itself go far enough. According to the letter issued to planning authorities in February by the Chief Planner on behalf of the Scottish Government, where a new residential property is to be developed within the vicinity of an existing music venue, the responsibility for mitigating adverse effects should sit with the housing developer as the agent of change. Pretty clear. But what Glasgow City Council's approval of this housing development application in May says, by contrast, is it should be noted that the nearby licensed concert venue 
has a duty and obligation to control and manage noise within the premises and any noise escape and ensure their premises are suitably sound attenuated. In other words, for this planning authority, the chief planner's letter, which introduced the principle of agent of change to planning practice in Scotland for the first time, has not been applied. That letter directed planning authorities to ensure that issues around the potential impact from live music venues are always appropriately assessed and addressed when considering proposals, either by venues themselves or for development in their vicinity, and that decisions reflect the agent of change principle. Well, clearly that has not happened in this case. And of course, Glasgow City Council will not be the only authority which has yet to change its approach to such issues in line with the new ministerial guidance. The problem is that while that new guidance is welcome, it is only guidance. Until the agent of change principle is enshrined in law, venues like King Tut's in Glasgow and others across the country will remain under threat. That is why I think the Local Government and Communities Committee recognised in its Stage 1 report in the Planning Bill that a principle not enshrined in statute will always be open to interpretation and to challenge in circumstances where councils have traditionally been used to giving developers the benefit of the doubt. So if we are to secure the objectives which are shared by Ministers and by the Local Government Committee and I suspect by the great majority of members of this Parliament and of course by the music industry and music venues, we need to go beyond guidance and enshrine the principle uh, of agent of change in planning law. That way we can really protect all of our live music venues, both in Glasgow and across Scotland. Thank you very much. And I call on, I call on Fiona Hislop to close the Government Cabinet Secretary, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and also thank you to Adam Tompkins for the opportunity to have this important debate. Uh, perhaps it's even more important now in light of that terrible and devastating fire at the Basel School of Art, which also obviously spread to the adjacent uh, O2 ABC building, one of the city's major live music venues, as we've heard in this debate. And while investigations will now take place to establish what happened and what can be done, it's also important that we do not lose sight of the many great things that are currently happening in Glasgow, in particular around music. And Glasgow is recognised internationally for its vibrant and thriving music scene, which attracts music lovers from all over the world. And as we've heard, and as the report clearly sets out, this translates into an important economic contribution and more than a thousand full-time jobs. But the value of music to Glasgow is far from limited to economic benefits. Music, in particular live music, enriches people's lives, it enhances our society, it makes a huge contribution to our culture and also how others see us. See us. And it demonstrates what a vibrant, lively and exciting place Glasgow, but also Scotland is. And music is in the very fabric of the city, which is why it has been named a UNESCO City of Music. And this is a great recognition, which, uh, as a number of speakers have said, deserves to be brought to the fore. And last year, when I met Councillor David McDonald, the then new, the appointed chair of Glasgow Life, he shared his plans to make more of that UNESCO designation. Uh, in March this year, I met the Deputy Director General of UNESCO in Paris, and I expressed our strong support for UNESCO's work and our commitment to promote and harness the value that their recognition brings and he was also very pleased in March where I told him of the Glasgow City Council's undertakings to make more of the UNESCO City of Music recognition. Glasgow has a great opportunity to put its name on the music map, it already does, through the recognition and the networks that it brings and working in partnership we need to do everything we can we can to ensure that that opportunity isn't lost. Uh, Tom Arthur, in his remarks, effectively made the important point about the grassroots venues as being a pipeline of music opportunity and talent. I've already tasked my officials um, last year to look at what can be done in terms of support, and it has already been discussed with other jurisdictions, Wales and others, at the British uh, Irish Council, including the discussions around ag agents of change. Festivals, of course, are a key part of the music experience in Glasgow. The world's largest winter festival, uh, Celtic Connections, is a great showcase of Scottish traditional music. Earlier this year, I decided to open up the festival's Expo Fund uh, to include Celtic Connections for the first time, enabling them to apply for funding of up to £100,000 in the 18-19 budget. Set up in 2008, the festival's Expo Fund uh, also supports artists from Celtic Connections to make their most of their career opportunities internationally. And of course, nobody's mentioned that this summer we'll also see again the World Pipe Band Championships, which again has a fantastic opportunity to bring people for music to the city. 
Four of our five national performing companies are based in Glasgow, the Royal Scottish National Orchestra, the National Theatre of Scotland, Scottish Ballet and Scottish Opera. Uh, now, in the 12th year of direct uh, government support, uh, they're making significant contribution to Glasgow and across all of Scotland um, and also in terms of the major infrastructure investments that this government has provided, capital support of £5.4 million uh, pounds to develop the Glasgow Theatre Royal for Scottish Opera and £8.5 million pounds to support the creation of a new home for the Royal Scottish National Orchestra as part of the Glasgow Royal Concert Hall. And that new National Orchestra Centre not only provides the orchestra with state-of-the-art operational base, but also provided Glasgow with a purpose-built music venue in addition. And the dedicated learning and engagement centre supports music making and creativity for young people and communities across Scotland. But of course, much of this debate has been about contemporary music or in Brian Whittle's point, uh, contemporary music that was once contemporary, but is now part of the history of, of, many, of many. Um, the National Museum of Scotland will this week open a major exhibition over the summer dedicated to Scottish pop music, Rip It Up, exploring the musical culture of Scotland over more than half a century, featuring artists and bands from Orange Juice to Franz Ferdinand. And live music venues are an important part of why people come to Glasgow for music. And I was saddened to obviously to hear about the fire this weekend at the O2 ABC. We have a number of much-loved venues uh, which have provided both a stage for emerging new talent and some of the biggest names in the music, in music industry. Um, we've got venues that uh, include the Barlands, uh, I think I saw the alarm there once, um, the King Tuts, the sub club that have played such a pivotal role not only in the careers of, Sc of Scottish but also international acts and that's a very important point that Polly McNeil made in terms of the relevance now to the international aspects. And uh, their character and uniqueness uh, are a key part of that live music experience. And I was also pleased to see that the SEC Hydro was the fourth busiest arena in the world in 2017 in terms of ticketed sales, according to Polestar, behind only the O2 in London, Madison Square Garden and Manchester Arena. So that very quick and rapid uh, you know, ascent to that top experience, world-class experience is something that we should be very conscious of. So whether it's long established or new and emerging, we need to protect the culturally and socially significant space that music venues provide. provide. And I want to pay tribute particularly to Lewis MacDonald because he has pursued this issue for some time. Also to, count, to, to um, those that have on the local government committee where uh, Bob Doris, who the convener, made sure that there was extended evidence on this particular subject as part of the planning bill consideration. And that is precisely why the Minister for Local Government and Housing announced earlier this year our intention to introduce the agent of change principle into the next uh, planning framework. At the same time, uh, as we've heard, the Chief Planner wrote to all planning authorities, highlighting the Scottish Government's support for agent of change, specifically asking them to ensure that issues around the potential impact of noise from live music venues are always appropriately assessed and addressed. And in giving evidence to the Local Government and Communities Committee on the planning bill, the Music Venue Trust noted, and I quote, that Scotland is already leading the way um, in the UK with the strength of our message on agent of change. We have viewed the inclusion of the agent of change principle in the national planning framework as the appropriate approach, and the planning bill seeks to strengthen the status of uh, the framework. Nevertheless, I understand the Minister for Local Government and Housing is considering the views of the committee as to whether it might be appropriate to bring forward an amendment to the bill. And I, I undertake, if Elizabeth MacDonald hasn't already done so, to draw the attention of the Chief Planner and the Minister to the May case he was referring to in Glasgow in the generality of the policy issue. This year, of course, is a particularly exciting year for Glasgow, running alongside the biggest sporting event in Scotland since the Commonwealth Games. We have the 2018 European Championships. The Cultural Programme Festival 28 will deliver the best in music and other art forms. And through a groundbreaking cultural partnership between Glasgow and Berlin, a scaled-up Merchant City Festival will deliver the best in Scottish and international arts and entertainment. Music present officer will be the heart of this with a range of concerts and activities, including Mix the City, a digital online music platform creating musical soundscapes of Glasgow and Berlin. 
So this has been a, a very important, constructive and engaging debate. It puts uh, the importance of music rightly uh, front and centre. Uh, I'm very supportive of many of the comments that I've made that I think members might appreciate. And I will use my efforts to certainly uh, ensure that we continue to have uh, a great grassroots pipeline of music in Scotland, but also some of the practical issues that are facing the venues, whether it's immediate or indeed strategically can be addressed. Uh, we have great ambition to Sc uh, in Scotland, uh, but we also uh, have great talent. And there is something about the audiences uh, in Glasgow, which many have referred to, that is very special indeed. And I particularly like Adam Tomkins' comments that, yes, music makes Glasgow, but Glasgow makes music. And doesn't, doesn't it do that particularly well, President Officer? Thank you. Uh, thank you. That concludes the debate. And I've learned much more about Mr Tomkins than perhaps I ought to know. <laughs> and I close this meeting of Parliament.